There are few times in a person's life as drenched in absolute terror as your childhood. I know personally the stories and fears I picked up as a kid still in some cases influence me today. And there's no fear quite like the fear of something grabbing your leg as you run up the stairs of the spooky basement as a kid. For a lot of us, these hometown horrors are still the scariest things we may have ever had happen to us and determine quite a lot of the sorts of interest in the weird and terrifying we continue with to adulthood. This series, we will focus on these sorts of horrors from cursed houses to killers stalking the woods to amusement parks from hell. And that's where we're going to pick up today with the story of Traction Park. So, Action Park in Vernon, New Jersey. Shout out, New Jersey. Shout out, New Jersey. My, like, sister home state, you know, it's grown up in Staten Island. You, you're, you know, you're told you're from New York, but really you're from New Jersey. I spent a lot more time in Jersey than I ever did in, like, Manhattan. You know, Brooklyn and Jersey were, like, mm. the two most common places I was besides Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Jersey had this infamous park, this infamous water park. It wasn't really just a water park, but that's how most people remember it today. And so in in the in the year 2000, uh, Matthew Callan recalled Action Park with this great this great quote from an article in Freezer Box called Action Park in Memoriam. So Action Park made adults of a generation of tri-state area kids who strolled through its blood-stained gates. <laughs> By teaching us the truth about life, it is not safe, you will get hurt a lot, and you'll ride all the way home burnt beyond belief. <laughs> I, I, it's perfect. It's perfect, Marie. So, Just the kind of place you want your mom to drop you off for the day. Oh, 100%. Um, yeah, totally, so, totally. Marie, what... What amusement parks did you grow up with as a kid? Did you do you do you have any or any like stories from when you were a kid that you remember? Well, it's like I kind of like I have a couple like I have more like the ab absence of a uh, amusement park. Like my uncle would always take his his niece and nephew to Disneyland like every year and they would send me a care package of this fantastic, magical huge place oh, that no. I as a child would never get to see, never get to visit. Um, so it was just sort of like this, this, you know, like, oh man, that looks so cool. Oh, that does that's... look like those look like pirates. Well, Marie, um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna break you of that fantasy this episode. <laughs> yeah, and that's I mean, that's I mean it was and I, I will have to say that I think Disneyland and Action Park are probably on the on the opposite ends of the spectrum of what is an amusement park. Yeah, I think they're they're pretty much like as far apart as you can possibly get. I think park is the only thing that they share in common, the word park. And oh, even wait. then it's debatable and litigatable. Well, uh, so for me, for me growing up, my family, like especially so, you know, I've, I've talked about on the show, my parents got divorced. And so my my um, I spent more time with my dad and his, uh, you know, the step family that I grew up with really than I did with my mom. My mom was working. My dad like never worked. So, you know, um. It was, you know, I, 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 I spent more time with my dad, really, than I did with my mom, um, kind of growing up just based on the way that stuff happened. And everything else, my mom was more responsible and, and whatever. But anyways, so my my dad's house, we were pretty poor. Um, but one of the things that we splurged on was season tickets to Great uh, Great Adventure, Six Flags Great Adventure. Oh, man. Which was in Jersey, which was like right, you know, right over the bridge from us. I think it was like less than an hour drive. It might have been like 40 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. And so we always like we went, we got like, you know, early passes to it. So you'd always go and everything else. And like when I was a kid, I fucking loved amusement parks, Marie. <laughs> I loved them. Like I loved playing Roller Coaster Tycoon. I would we'd go to amusement parks. I would get the map of the whole park and I would go home and build it in, in roller coaster tycoon. Too. Are you kidding me? I swear. I was such a nerd. 
I was oh a total God, that, nerd. That's sort of adorable, though. My first screen name on AOL was based on my favorite roller coaster at Bush Gardens in Virginia, the Big Bad Wolf. So your screen name was the Big Bad Wolf, and it, it was, was named like after the, a roller I think coaster. It was the, I think it was the Wolf Ten because I was ten years old. The Wolf Ten, man! Oh, I was. I am so Google cool. searching. So I'm Google cool. searching that. I'm getting in the way back. So it, at Six Flags, uh, you know, you always heard crazy rumors about amusement parks, right? You'd, you'd hear about yeah. kids dying on rides or someone's head got chopped off when they were going to get a hat or. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, were they raised places. their hands and they got. Yeah. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or like, you know, cool. there were there were secret rooms, right? So there were there were rides that were shut down for too, for being too dangerous, but you could ride them at night or paths that you could kind of get around the park with that rich people got to travel on or got on the rides first or whatever. And, you know, one of my one of my favorite now as an adult, even one of my favorite uh, YouTube channels is actually called Defunct Land. I don't know if you've ever seen that, Marie. Yeah, it's so, a little depressing and a little cool. It's awesome. So it, it covers yeah. like it, yeah. it covers like lost media, but also the, the series that I love about it is it covers like lost amusement parks or amusement park rides. And so it talks about why they changed over time. And again, one of my one of my I, really one of the first mysteries that I got really interested in as a kid was at Bush Gardens in Virginia, you would take a tr- like a train through the park and you could see this like light blue roller coaster mm-hmm. that was never open and there was no there were no signs for it. It was off all the maps. No one ever mm-hmm. talked about it. You just saw this like this dismantled ride. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was obsessed with it. I was like, what is that ride? I want to know what it was and whatever. And one time I like I kind of got I went past one of the barriers and I saw the ride was called Draken Fire. And I was like, this is amazing. And, you know, I want I wanted to I You're wanted like, to be Draken on this ride. Fire. And it turns out that it, it shut down because it like wasn't it just wasn't popular. It just sucks, what? <laughs> you know, but I, I really love those sorts of urban legends and like lost stuff like that. Like, you know, again, at great flat at Six Flags, there was a ride called Viper, which was oh. like every time we visited, it was never open. It just was oh, it just was always it was always there. It looked sweet. I only ever got to ride it once, I think. And the reason I guess it was shut down now as an adult looking back was because they were never able to do any maintenance on it because the parts were too expensive. Oh, totally. That's that's those are the rides are the most dangerous too when they're always broken down. The one time you're going to ride it like that's going to be bad. The best ones, <laughs> the best ones, are the dangerous ones. And then, of mm-hmm. course, the, the greatest roller coaster of all time, in my opinion, Batman and Robin the Chiller. Um, this was a ride. Was that that, your like, next, was that the next screen name? It, had, it was not actually, but it should have been probably that one had um, it, it had a maglev thing. So it would shoot you from like, I don't know, like it would shoot you like 100 miles per hour in like a second, two seconds, you know, Uh-oh. and then you would or it was like six seconds. It wasn't a second. You wouldn't like again, your head wouldn't actually get chopped off, but <laughs> it would um, it would shoot you up and then you would kind of go. It was really a short ride, but it was super cool, super scary, really, really fun. And again, it never worked correctly after like the first year because of maintenance problems. And those things are probably expensive, right? Like, that's a huge amount of like custom parts, probably. Or even if it's not custom, you're still repairing that thing every day. They're extremely expensive. So. At those places, though, right? So besides it just being kind of like a magical part, I think, for a lot of kids growing up, like I know for me, probably some of my happier memories are at amusement parks. There were also really scary <laughs> urban legends. And part <laughs> part of that, I think, is because amusement parks are sort of. They're store sort of stationary carnivals. Yes. And carnivals yes. are terrifying. Yes. Right. They're yes. like. Yes. It, these places where, you know, you got clowns, you got <laughs> uh, carnies dealing drugs to teenagers to come party, mm-hmm. you know, you got mm-hmm. like murderers and stuff Allegedly. operating the rides, all this yeah. stuff, right? Now, full disclosure, Marie, my dad actually, when he first came to America, was in fact a carny. So I didn't even know that your dad was Canadian. I had, no, <laughs> first of all, no idea that he was a carny, and secondly, no idea that you have 
Canadian heritage. Why do you think I'm so personable? Uh, it's it is what it is all about. It's what it's all about, Marie. It's all the Canadianness. You're welcome. Yeah, when my You're dad Canada. So when my dad was like in his when my my dad moved out of his house when he was like a young teenager, and eventually would get basically smuggled into America, I guess. With a bunch of other Canadian carnies through the uh, Amusements of America, which was this like this. It's still they still operate carnivals today and everything else. But like that sounds so wholesome. Amusements of America. Amusements of America. But so, car, you know, carnivals are carnivals are associated with with transients, with people yeah. who kind of move into town and then move out of town. Yeah. And that always gets linked to the serial killer right? in, in our kind of modern <laughs> mythos. I mean, it's a close jump, but yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, what's yeah, crazy yeah. is that there are a lot of serial killers who are associated with carnivals, though. Oh, you have uh, relatively recently, James Michael Wright is thought mm-hmm. to have killed three women. He lured them to a carnival fairgrounds. Um, we know the story of like Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, where uh, Mr. Lake, before he kind of would... F- become a total monster that we know him today as the M lady bunker guy. Before that, he would hang around Renaissance fairs with a sideshow unicorn, which was just a goat with one horn. Um, And he would like try to lure women to take nude photos with him because he had this unicorn, I guess. Like, I don't really know what the argument was, but that was his whole thing. So these places can get creepy. These places can get pretty dark. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's places where people sort of they're going to let loose. Yeah. You know, they're, they're yeah. going to get they're going to get weird. And although they're supposed to be these amusement parks are supposed to be the clean stationary versions of carnivals, in my opinion. They're not always as safe or clean or secure as we might expect. So. Marie, what are the what horrible horror legends have you heard about amusement parks? Well, so not any ones in particular, but again, going back to Disneyland, since it is sort of the gold standard for this type of thing is, you know, you have all of the legends of they won't let someone die on the property. Right. That they sure. you are if you are if you are grossly injured, which does happen because it happens everywhere that you are escorted or they like load you up on some stretcher. And basically, you know, run you in the underground, in the underground passageways to outside of the property in Anaheim, where I guess they dump your, you know, your, uh, your corpse or your body (laughs) for the, uh, for the local authorities to find, which is one of the biggest rumors that I have heard about Disneyland. And it's sort of like, there's a lot of weird, that's just weird. You know, that's just sort of gruesome. But then there's some lighter ones, which, so I don't know if that's true, but I, the other rumor that I've heard is that the area over Disneyland is copy or is, um, is, is, in, is uh, copyright uh, or patent or whatever. It's like, it's protected. So you can't take a picture of it or you can't publish a picture of it. Of just the air or the space over it, over Hmm. the actual park itself. I would, I would. Which is, which is kind of crazy as well. So those are the two most kind of extreme ones that I have heard about. Like, you know, because I hear all, of course, like, oh, they stood up on the roller coaster, decapitated, they raised their hands, got them cut off, you know, stuff like that or electrocuted or stuff like that. But it's mostly like when you talk about the big parks that have the more specific kind of weird, creepy ones. You'd, you know, so. The air one is just a mystery. I do not understand that one bit. I mean, I guess I could see not being able to take a photo of from the air below. Yes. So not being able to, like, take a picture to, like, break the illusion or even, like, see new rides being developed and stuff like that. Like, I could see that being true. But not being able to take a picture of the sky, that doesn't make any damn sense. Anyway, I know. Well, I know. I'm and maybe I'm grossly overstating it. So I apologize, Disney. Um, But (laughs) it was was sort of like but it's sort of like weird stuff like that. Right. Where it doesn't make you're kind of trying to like you hear something and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But it like a good urban legend, it just sort of maintains itself. It makes enough sense. 
Yeah, you're like, well, you know, Disney's pretty, you know, they got a pretty tight rein on on their marketing and and their image. So that might make sense. That makes sense. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Well, what I think is so funny is when you think about the the perfect storm of a bad amusement park. (laughs) All of it was true at Action Park. Oh, God. All of it was true at Action Park. And we're all the gonna, urban legends were true. All of the I mean, almost all the urban legends are true at Action Park. And that's what we're going to get into after this break. All right. Action Park, Action Park. Didn't they have a commercial, too? They did. I remember. You know, what's funny. I remember the commercials as a kid with a jingle. I think we went there. Be a once. Jingle. Oh, my God. Um, I'm, I you you did not go. With your mom's knowledge, right? No, I think we did. I think we because Vernon, New Jersey is right near where my aunt lives. Oh, my God. I think we went. We either went to that one or we went to the one that they had in Pennsylvania in the Poconos. Which you can't even remember that one. I can't even remember that name. That one's a little bit less deadly. I think. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Action Park was founded initially in May of 1978. And the idea at the time was there were all these places in America that were like ski resorts, right? So people would go to ski and tube and whatever in the winter. But what do you do in the summer? How are you going to make money on that land in the summer? And so uh, the company that owned the area, right? So the area was called the Vernon Valley Great Gorge Ski Area. It was owned by Great American Recreation, decided that they were going to try and do what some other places had done by creating other summertime attractions people could enjoy uh, to create this sort of year long source of income. Mm. So the area as initially envisioned would have things like, you know, for example, like a, like slide rides. Yeah. That were pretty, yeah. pretty common t- sorts of slides and everything else. So the first one, uh, the first version of the park had an Alpine slide. It had uh, swimming pools. It had a tennis court. It had softball fields. It was just kind of like a park with one ride really. Yeah. That, area would initially become known as the Alpine Center of Action Park, and it would include that first main attraction, a 2,700 foot long Alpine slide. Huh. That seems a little long. I'm just going to throw that out there. That feels like a long slide. Well, so Alpine slides are actually fairly common in Europe. They're not as common in the United States. And actually today, there is a safer version of an Alpine slide that people maybe are more familiar with. Okay. Basically, though, the way that this thing works is your, the slide sits below a ski lift. Uh-huh. And so the ski lift brings people up to the top of the slide. You then sit down onto like a skateboard kind of thing. It's it's like a like a cart, you know, kind of like a mm-hmm. cart, but it has mm-hmm. no there's no seat belt. There's no anything. There's there's a place for you to put your hands mm-hmm. and there's a, a lever. And so the handle that lever allows you to either break as you pull it back or go faster as you push it forward. The sleds then careen down this <laughs> concrete course mm. at, at, at mm-hmm. speed. you yeah, really mm. fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. And again, you can mm-hmm. sort of control it, but not mm-hmm. really because there's no driving mechanism. You just have a thing that says stop or go faster or not. not even really stop. It's just like slow down. It's like I, slowing down. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's Yeah. Yeah. And so there's actually a really good documentary on Action Park. There's a couple of them now, actually, that are out there. But the most famous one is one that was on HBO. Yeah. And so from that, we get some really great quotes from former workers and people that worked there. And so one of them was a former worker said that the sleds had two speeds, um, you know, fast and death awaits. (laughs) Now, the track itself, this Alpine slide track was made of it wasn't just like concrete. It was concrete. Mm fiberglass and then like filler, right? So like asbestos and like other stuff like that. Mm. And so what it meant was anytime you scraped yourself, if like your leg was hanging out of the thing wrong and you hit a curve the wrong way, any of that kind of stuff, you got like you were scraped to crap. You know what (laughs) I mean? Like you were bleeding. And on top of that too, because there was no seatbelt, there's not, there's nothing also just to make it clear Mm -hmm. There's nothing keeping you on the track like there's there's no like locking mechanism for the cart underneath it to like hit your thing and then keep you there. It's you're just on a 
on a less safe bobsled. It's like not even built up on the sides, right? I no, mean, like, it's, it's almost no. like just like this, this, this um, rectangle of of plastic or fiberglass or whatever with some sort of with the wheels and then some sort of quote unquote braking mechanism. But there's yeah. nothing. There's no sides. There's no. I, I don't even really think there was a backrest from what I remember seeing. No, there's no backrest. There's there's, there's literally not like there's nothing. Not, no, you're not wearing a helmet. You don't have gloves no. on. You don't no. have like you're just no. you're literally just going down a tr- a huge hill. A huge hill on a like yeah 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 on, on just like a cart on but it's concrete. It's a concrete hill. It's not even like it's grass or no. snow or whatever. No. No. So. All of the danger of all of the danger of skiing with none of the softness of snow. But yeah, no, no, no. On top of that, because there's no nothing keeping you down there, you would just like if you turn too hard or you didn't know how to take the turns, because, of course, like how many people are riding this thing multiple times? If you didn't know how to take the turns, it was really easy to fly off. And again, oh you're the ride is going down underneath the chairlift. And so you can imagine, like, anyone who's been on the road in New Jersey knows that, like, people are spitting and, like, throwing shit at you and, like, whatever. You're underneath a chairlift of, like, angry teenagers who want to get on this ride. You're going to get stuff thrown at you. Oh, my God. The, the <sighs> This ride, the Alpine attraction, in my opinion, it, it encompasses the entirety of what was wrong about Action Park. <laughs> First off, the ride had terrible initial design. Right. So the this yeah. ri- this and, and the thing is too, Action Park, it's kind of fascinating because Action Park was it was it was sort of in it was very innovative over its lifetime. It had a lot of types of rides and ideas for rides that would go on to be popular in other places that were brand new to it. Yeah, but they the were United- just safe other places. Right. right. The Action Park was like the test the test bed where you saw how many people you could kill with the ride. And then other parks would be like, all right, we can do this, but we're going to lower everything like 50 percent on top of it being a bad initial design. The ride also had a total lack of maintenance. So the Mm -hmm. carts were often broken. The the brakes usually didn't work on them. Well, actually, there was two. There were two problems with the with the actual carts themselves. Either the brake would be stuck to on. So you would go down the thing kind of like jerkily always stopping and going and stopping and going or the brake wouldn't work at all. And so you just went down at like a (laughs) comet's pace. So again, if I may ask a quick question, just as, just as curiosity, like where are the people that are working? Like where's the supervision in any of this? That's the other thing. The people who worked at the park were mostly drunk teenagers. (sighs) It was mostly yeah. <laughs> it was mostly kids from like the local area and Action Park was notorious for having really lax alcohol laws and enforcement. There were beer stands everywhere because people would get liquored up and then have fun. So it was, you know, just a total shit show. I mean, everything was wrong. And the people that worked there would go out of their ways to make it more extreme for people. You know, there are stories of other other you know, on these sorts of rides On the Alpine slide, you have kids on on these documentaries. They were kids at the time recalling like, you know, you would give your friends the ones that didn't have the brakes. (laughs) They thought it was like a lot more fun. Oh, my God. So uh, on top of that, though, too, even just having like no break and break and some of them that break and then some of them that don't uh, leads to tremendous crashes. There are like even on the modern ones that are pretty safe. There are oh, horrible videos on YouTube of like, you know, a grandma with a little kid on one of these alpine slides breaking so they can like see the valley or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then a teenager just going at breakneck speed, not breaking fast enough and just ramming into the grandma and the kid, you know, oh, <laughs> just grandma's fucking dead. Oh, <laughs> like, God. It, it oh, was God. it was yeah. a super duper common thing for crash crashes to happen. Yeah. Um, all kinds of problems. So no one is moderating like how fast anyone goes down. No, and no one is. There is no algorithm for that. Exactly. And so that's the other thing, too. You would think and this is actually, again, a very common problem on these sorts of rides at a well-maintained park where there are like, again, if you play Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, which I suggest for everybody in the world, 
<laughs> there are there are safe limits that you can have for how long a car or a, a rider will go through a ride. Right. So right. if there was a if there was a thing like this, this Alpine slide, in theory, the the fastest you could get somebody to go on it after someone else and be safe was the amount of time that like an average person could accelerate to meet the second car. Right. Right. So like Which would there's involve some math. So that's not happening. No, it's not happening. <laughs> the other oh way, God. though, if you really, really wanted to be kind of conservative in your estimate would be mm -hmm. you take the slowest somebody could possibly go with the brake turned all the way up going down. Mm -hmm. How long would it take them to go down? Well, it also depends on their weight, right? It does also. But with the brake, in theory, it shouldn't depend on it the brake. But okay. again, that's like assuming that they're limiting people from riding on this thing. And we've also already put in more thought into that than anyone ever did when this ride was operable. Oh, way, or being way, built. Oh, way more thought, like a hundred times more thought. We just asked more questions than they probably ever did. did. I mean, because also remember, this is 1970s. There's regulatory, especially for stuff like this, was probably, you know, you know, lax at best. Like you're bringing up liquor laws and all of this stuff. It's like I, it was it was just it was just uh, no man's land is what I can imagine. A hundred percent. So you ended up with a real serious problem here. The ride in one season produced 14 fractures and 25 head injuries. Jesus. This is from the local, like a local report on the ride or on, on the park itself. Um, it also, you know, and this is not counting like bruises, scrapes, abrasions, everything else. These the, are like things that had to be hospitalized versus just. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Action Park had to buy more ambulances for the county. <laughs> Because of how many people were going to the hospital. So they were actually good for that tax bracket. They were it's actually crazy. good for for infrastructure. Oh, they were great. In were great. Vernon is what you're saying. They were probably great. So the yeah. it, crazily um, employment for teens, more, you know, more employment for health care providers. Uh, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, increased liquor sales. You've got so you got some big tenants for actually running a running a good uh, a good campaign. Yeah, if you were like running for president. No, yeah, and you and you can like get rid of, uh, you know, overpopulation problems. Over right, it's great. What a time. exactly you're calling down the herd. So this so un unfunnily, this ride the Alpine Slide is the site of the first fatality at Action Park. Notice I'm saying first. God, right. So 19 year old George Larson Jr., who his family claimed that he was a part. He, he, I mean, not claim he was a worker at the park. Mm -hmm. The the ownership of of uh, the ownership of Action Park at the time claimed that he was not a worker. He was whatever. But it's like, what mm -hmm. what does it matter if he was a worker or not? You killed somebody with yeah, your idiot ride. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He went down the, the Alpine slide again too quickly. The brake on his car was broken. He didn't get he didn't take a turn correctly. He jumped off the track, flew off and hit his head on a rock. One of the many rocks like boulder sized rocks that used to dot the turns of the Alpine slide. Because of else course, would like, why wouldn't you also have a broken glass and rock area yeah. Yeah. on the side where the grass supposedly would be soft enough to, to, to protect you? Yeah, so there's some boulders in there. What's yeah. so this happened nice. in 1980, the first fatality. The park opened in like 1978. Uh, so this is this is like within the first two years of the park being so open. I am sure after this action park took immediate, immediate corrective actions for everything that they've done going forward. Right. I mean, this type of like event would be enough to to set them on the course to be responsible. Incorrect, Marie. Oh, come so, on. Crazily, after this event, after the death of a of a of a patron, that's when the that's when the park got popular. <laughs> of course it did. People were like, sweet. So you know why? America. America. So America. They then added their second. They they they, they then added their next two areas. So mm -hmm. they had the mm -hmm. Alpine area. Mm -hmm. They then added an area called Motor World and an area called Water World. 
Mm. Motor World had like driving type rides. So it had like bumper cars, go karts. Uh, and then Water World had stuff like, you know, water pools, wave pools, slides, that kind of stuff. Mm. Mm. The park really becomes popular. First off, the rides are the rides are fun. You know, it's a good time, whatever. But mostly the park becomes popular because it lacks security and lacks enforcement of drinking rules. Oh, On top of that, again, beer was everywhere at this park. They actually had their own brewery. They were one of the first microbreweries in the United States. I didn't know that. They That's had a brewery insane. on site. Because I'm sure that the beer was hygienically made and didn't make anyone sick and had a <laughs> controlled alcohol content. The, honestly, sure the they put the, uh, the amount of rigor and acumen into making, into brewing beer that they do into, you know, cultivating a safe park. What's funny, it's a lot harder uh, to make unsafe beer than it is to make unsafe rides. They probably, <laughs> the beer was probably the least dangerous thing you could do at Action Park. Oh if you just God. sat there and got wasted in the sun, you were probably safer than going on any of the fucking rides. Oh my God. The um, Motor World was was mm -hmm. in particular uh, notorious because you had these you had these um, these go karts, right? But mm -hmm. they were they were able to go like forty miles per hour <laughs> with no no. So listen, they they could go forty miles per hour with the right controls on the ride, right? So like the motor was limited. But the people working the ride found that you could jam a tennis ball in the regulator and let it go up to like 70 miles per hour. So here's the thing. 40 miles an hour is a car. That's a car. You can go 40 miles an hour on a road like a, a, a go kart or a cart. You really shouldn't go that fast. No. Well, that's the thing. These aren't they're not really go karts. They're like they're just little fucking cars. <laughs> they're just Really dangerous cars, it's, right? Again, so, no seat belts, no. It's crazy, right? And so oh, people would seventy miles an hour. That's really good. That's people great. would, um, people at the park were able to, again, because there was no, because there was no control over like who got beer and who didn't, who was being served, everything else, whatever. People would get just fucking hammered, and then go onto the go karts, and again, they're just driving drunk. And so the uh, go-karts would often become like bumper cars. Well, yeah. And so in theory, the they don't have bumpers. That's in, the <laughs> in theory, the go-karts had in theory, the go-karts had a track that you were supposed to follow. Like they had like a road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. not on normal mm -hmm. go-karts, there's like things on the side to keep you from going off road or whatever. There were yeah. none of those at Action Park. Yeah. So people could just get drunk and just drive around <laughs> in the grass on the in the fields and shit. This is horrifying. This is Amazing. really it's 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 we're laughing because it is it's funny. But to imagine that that existed and was open for as long as it did. And like, I mean, it's just like that's insanity. It You know what it reminds me of is another video game, Bioshock. They had a they had a, a game called Bioshock Infinite where the whole premise is like you're you go to this area where like, you know, American ideals and Americanization has become the religion. And so it's like, you know, there's no no protection for anything and all this other stuff and whatever. Like Action Park is like, you know, it's, it's like this completely deregulated, terrifying amusement park market. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like completely the laissez faire, right? There's no regulation. There's no rules like. The invisible hand of the market is, is guiding it, right? Whatever makes money, whatever is the most profitable, makes the most profit sense is what you're is what you're being. I love how we go in straight into Marxism for this. But it's true, right? I mean, it's like there's no regulatory. There's nobody. Tell, there's no nanny state. There's no one telling you no. There's no infrastructure, right? We're not fixing anything. We are doing we're giving the people everything they want and we're making money. What's that book called? Insanity. The That's what would happen. Lord of the Flies. It is Lord of the Flies in an amusement park. It is. It is like Jersey Lord of the Flies. This is so. Then now it does sound right. kind of fun. I mean, in a real sick way, it does sound kind of fun. It sounds great if you have like a helmet on. So no, no helmets, no helmets. <laughs> <laughs> so then besides the motor world being like just dangerous by its again, just completely by its design. Yes. Another area that would come to be really famously dangerous is the water world. And especially a ride that the, it's a ride that would become known in the area as the grave pool. OK, so 
he, they didn't build. So there wasn't anything. This whole entire thing was in complete liability, right? Like there's no safe place. The safest place is maybe the parking lot. Maybe. Yes. First Outside, when you get there. The Not when after you've been there for a while. And really quickly, too, if I may just add one other thing before you go into the grave pool, which is great, is from watching the documentary and what I remember, there's not a lot of shade. It's no, no, there's the, no, there's like no, 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 no. So it's like 90 degrees, like and you're out all day. I mean, I, on average, I bet they had like the best you could come out is like heat stroke, right? Dehydration and heat stroke. Yeah, sure. That's a good outcome. OK, well, especially sorry. you're getting drunk. Yeah, exactly. You're getting drunk all day. Exactly. You're getting hammered. You're going to drunk yeah. all day. You're just yeah. going to lay there. You're going to become, high, you know, heat stroke and dehydrated. But that's a, that's probably the safest. That's the best scenario. Absolutely. OK, please continue to the grave pool. <laughs> so and actually, Marie, we're going to get into why there was no like liability or anything else at the end. Okay. So Good. The, the, the ride actually Good. was called the tidal wave pool. Uh. It opened in 1981. And originally it took the place of the softball fields that we can only assume like shot softballs right at people's heads. <laughs> it's the only thing we can assume. About it. This the pool was 100 feet wide by 250 feet long. Oh, my God. And so we can hold up to a thousand people. The That's waves again. This is one of the first body of water. This is, is one of the first wave pools in the United States. Oh. The waves generated for 20 minutes with 10 minute intervals between wave sections. Now, despite mo so modern wave pools, they get as high as like your waist. Right. Yeah, because the waves, yeah. when they come in, they basically double the size of the water in right. the area. So the waves, you know, sometimes can they're designed so that the waves don't wash over your head. Right. Because that would be commonly known as what's what am I thinking? Drowning. That's yes. Drowning. Not true of the wave pool. This pool got deeper the closer to the wave generating structures you got. Oh, my. And the waves could get as high as 40 inches above the waterline. So for our European listeners, that's a meter. So, and this was for kids? It was for everybody. Oh, my God. On top of that, the pool was filled with fresh water as opposed to chlorinated pool water. Ew. Which made people used to swimming in pools much, much less buoyant. It made swimming a lot harder for them in the regular fresh water. Yeah. And that's just gross. On top of that, the people going to the pool were often drunk. But yeah. They're coming from urban areas. There's not there's not a lot of swimming you can do in New Jersey and New York. I mean, you can swim in New York City, kind of. You can go to the beach, but like, who wants to get stabbed? <laughs> but really, who wants? Which is still safer than Action Park. So you end up, you end up with this again, a perfect scenario where the water is deeper than people expect it to be, as they right. get closer to the wave generating structures. Right. You have loads of people getting into the water, many of whom don't know how to swim. Okay. So you end up in this like water stampede where people are like flipping over as these meter high waves come washing over them. And you, if you're a kid, you're just fucking, you know, you're, you're just getting bounced around. Oh my God. It's like a mosh pit. With they waves. had, the park had 12 lifeguards on duty at any one time. And each lifeguard would save on average 30 people a day. Okay. That's insane. That is insane. Now, a normal swimming pool, a normal swimming pool at a normal amusement park, you see one to two saves per season per lifeguard. 30 people a day and there's 12. 12 lifeguards, each of them, each of them save 30 people. The lifeguards themselves would come to know the area in the wave pool past shoulder height water as the death zone. OK, so not only do you have the grave pool, but you have the death zone in the grave pool. Well, so think about this, right? So oh you're God. able to get this is when the water is still. You mm -hmm. can go into the area where the water is still where it goes up to your neck. Mm -hmm. Then a fucking meter high wave comes roaring towards you. You're drunk. You're dehydrated. You honestly aren't a good swimmer. <laughs> 
What, what are you going to do but drown? So on a, in a week, in seven days, that means those lifeguards would have saved 2,520 people. Yeah. At peak every, operation, yeah. Every week. Absolutely. Every week. They would, in the, in the documentaries, I don't think this was in the HBO one. I think this is on a different one, but they would, they talked about how, I know this was the HBO one. They talked about how they would give new lifeguards the death zone duty because they wanted them to like, within minutes, they would have to save somebody. Oh my God. And they were like, welcome, you know, welcome to the fucking show, kid. <laughs> Get ready. How many, like, how many life, like, and so granted you have these kids, they're lifeguards, but like how many lifeguards could you hire? Like somebody, do they don't work seven days a week, right? Like you probably would have mm. to have. That's a good question. Like, Honestly, I, I mean, don't know. And That's how many question. qualified teenage lifeguards sober are out there at any given time? In a New Jersey summer, if it takes these jobs. Well, that's the other like, thing, it, too, right? Be a part of me, but it's like, yeah, this is super fun and we're partying and this is great and I feel great. But, you know, for for maybe like whatever minimum wage was at that point, it's probably not worth it. No, it's def- I mean, it's I'm going to go stock shelves at the uh, at the local uh, well, Lucky or whatever it was. You could be scraping blood off the Alpine slide. Why the hell do you want to work at the, gra- right, the grave? Just hosing down the Alpine slide. Yeah, why would I get the brain matter out of the Alpine slide? That sounds a lot easier. Or fixing, so, you could be fixing the fixing the carts on the Alpine slide, which is other, basically just sitting there, you know, smoking a bowl with your buddy. The other <laughs> thing to remember with the wave pool is yeah. the way a wave pool works is it sucks in water and then pumps it out. So right. you're also getting like, the closer you get to the water generating structures, you're getting like, there's pressure, a pressure differential forms to like suck you under a wave. That's what happens with a normal wave too. When you go out into the ocean. It's like riptide. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's riptide. So it would, it would, it would only be a year. So in nine, again, the pool opened in 1981, 1982, Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. that season, the pool would claim its first victim of death, a 15 year old visitor who drowned um, in the wave pool. Oh, my God. Now, this this year, 1982, would kind of be a one two punch for the park. Uh, Another fatality would occur at Waterworld. What happened in this case was a uh, 27 year old from Long Island was on a ride known as the kayak experience. The basic idea of the kayak experience was you're in a kayak and you're it's supposed to be like simulated rapids. So there's. These there's these fans that are shooting water up to make the effect of like a whitewater rafting experience. Oh, my God. So people would often like flip out of their kayaks, then have to get back in them because, again, these are they're just kayaks. It's just somebody going on a whitewater river thing, but they're drunk and they're from New Jersey (laughs) or New York City. So they've never been in a kayak before. This is the first time they've ever even heard the word kayak. Oh, God. So what happened was this 27 year old, he flips out of his kayak he's there with his family and as he's trying to write the kayak his foot touches a, a piece of metal and the metal or this is what they think happened the metal was not grounded correctly oh, and so he was electrocuted uh to death oh my god so him and his family were both electrocuted but he had like a cardiac arrest afterwards and, and died oh my god and so later in the in the in you the don't park, even think about the electron. You don't even think about that. No. So in the in the in the like parks, electrocuted is not. Yeah. Yeah. The family oh oh, electrocuted is not the top 10 things you think of. No. That would uh, we've already talked park. about the top 10 thing. Drowning, you know, clubbing your head. Heat stroke. You know, <laughs> drunk heat stroke, yeah, alcohol poisoning. Drunk, you know, getting stampede, riptide and now electrocution. Sweet. The. The park, so there would be an investigation into this one because, you know, the Water World one and the other one are, as terrible as it sounds, fairly self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. This one, they, there was an investigation into. The family would claim that this was due to a faulty wire, like a, a wire that was just loose. But the park would claim to be vindicated because it wasn't a faulty wire. They just grounded the electricity wrong. So the entire floor of the thing was electrified. Oh, my God. Like, so that's, it's, oh my it's crazy. God. Essentially, there was like there was a uh, like three. I think it was like 
whatever it was, high enough amperage to murder somebody current. There was enough current flowing through the ground at random intervals that it's actually like a, a surprise not more people were electrocuted. Well, yeah. So oh God. that year there were two there were two fatalities at the park. Now again, we're just talking fatalities here. There were other yeah. things that were notoriously dangerous. So two of them besides that you've already talked about. Yeah. So oh so God. two so two other ones, right? So there was there were rides known as the Tarzan Swings and the Cannonball Falls ride. Now these two were both dangerous for the exact same reason. Uh, Tarzan Swing, kind of self-explanatory. It's a rope over a swimming pool. You jump on the rope, you f- you fly over, and then you jump in. The Cannonball Falls though were a set of covered water slides that were like dark inside. They were black slides. Mm-hmm. And so the cannonball slides, what would happen is it, you would you would go down it. And again, one of the slides had like a 90 degree turn in it. So you would just like wham into the fucking wall at, again, like breakneck speed. Uh-huh. And again, both of these would dump you off in water. Now, the issue with the water here, most most amusement parks, the water is kept at a high temperature. Right. Usually yes. around uh, like 15 degrees Celsius, right? Or yeah. for our for us in here in the United States, around yeah. 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Huh. Again, to save money, Action Park used natural spring water for a lot of its rides from the local area. And so in these two attractions, they dumped visitors into into spring water pools, which oh, were God. often as cold as 50 degrees, even in the winter. Or even, sorry, even in the summer. So that's 10 degrees oh Celsius. Oh my God. That's freezing cold. That's so really you, cold. So you are on this ride, you jump or you, you, you go through the slide and then you're dropped into freezing water. And you're drunk too. You're drunk. And you're drunk. Yeah, and and you're again, drunk. Yeah. the shock from being dipped into cold water, like anyone who's ever done like a polar bear dive or mm-hmm. even just mm-hmm. like, even just mm-hmm. jumped into a cold pool from a hot summer day, you know that like the first couple of seconds are you getting your bearings. Mm-hmm. These were like 10 feet deep pools that you would get plunged into. So it just created completely dangerous a bunch situations. of people over you, like jumping on top of you. Right. And then yeah, that's the thing. No too. one's regulating any of this. Yeah, again, exactly. Right. There's always people just falling on you. So <laughs> this that the Tarzan swing had an unofficial death. Oh my God. When somebody supposedly had a heart attack after being plunged into the freezing water. Oh my God. They're just, their body went into shock and they had a heart attack. Oh my so, God. So, and again, we're, we're focusing here again on deaths. Uh, one ride that I think is just encapsulates the entire, again, danger of this park. Super speed boats. This one doesn't get a lot of coverage. It, it's not it's not in like it's it's in some of the documentaries, but it's not usually as as covered as I think it maybe should be. Again, these were it's like the the boat version of the uh, Motor World go karts. These were boats that could be driven at up to 40 miles per hour around a small pond in the park. Again, often drunk riders would ram into each other at max speed, destroying boats, destroying each other. And the pond was known by workers and park owners to be a breeding ground for local snakes. Bingo. (laughs) I have action park bingo. I had my final, my final square with snakes. Snakes? I didn't think I was going to get it. You did, Marie. Just just imagine you're in a boat going 40 miles per hour. A drunk psychopath is chasing you in a boat. And if you fall out of the boat, you go into a water filled with snakes. With snakes. It's like it's an water actual nightmare. Too. Come to that life. Is like, that's just, they're not just like ground snakes. They're like water snakes. So you're just like you're thrown out and then you're covered with snakes. Oh, <laughs> my God. Like, why? <laughs> I don't think like. I honestly don't think like if you were Stephen King, you could come up with something like it's this. Like so there is no way because you'd be like, no, there's no way. There's no way. There's no way. After the, the thing, yeah, there's no the way. thing. The thing that's crazy about it is it's <laughs> this. It's just it's just everyday evil. 
you know, <laughs> it's like what like like it like what made it so scary if you read Stephen King's it for me yeah. Yeah. like obviously the clown is scary and everything else yeah. but it's the other people in the town just ignoring it yeah 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 it, you yeah. know yeah. it's yeah. it's the yeah. the town itself is what's cursed and evil yeah this is like the owners knew these things were dangerous they oh, yeah. knew like everyone who, who everyone who worked there knew it was dangerous. They had seen people get hurt. The state of New Jersey knew it was dangerous and nobody did anything. It took multiple deaths and like hundreds of injuries. So oh. if you if you know anything about Action Park before this or if you Google it, I, I guarantee one of the first images you're going to see is of a ride that was known as the Cannonball Loop. Mm -mm -mm. This was a water slide. It was a covered water slide that basically you would fall down at like a 65 degree angle before going into a vertical loop, a tight <laughs> vertical loop too. not even like, you know, at a lot of amusement parks, when you go into a loop, it's like a pretty protracted thing. So your, mm -hmm. your G forces are uh, distributed. No, no, yeah. no. Spread this out. was yeah. like a super quick loop. It was this ride was so the legend has it that the ride was designed. Uh, the park ownership flew over a Swedish ride designer for one day. The guy designed the ride and then they flew him back to Sweden. It, <sighs> there are stories from workers of the park that the owner of Action Park would offer people a hundred dollars to ride the ride. <laughs> so if he's willing to shell out money, the owner's willing to shell out money, you know, it's dangerous, right? You know, there's something you shouldn't take that money. You absolutely know it is. The, the ride itself would be open for like, like less than a week out of the year. It was closed uh, so it was only open for a single month in 1985 when it started before it was shut down by the New Jersey Advisory Board on Carnival Amusement Ride Safety. And the reason <laughs> is that the, show up. it was, yeah, I know, after it's open <laughs> for a been? month, <laughs> yeah. it was shut down because of just the sheer number and frequency of, of reports of injuries. Oh, my God. It's rumored that, again, besides paying $100 for people like at the park to try to uh, that the test dummies they used to test it came out decapitated um, at the end of the ride. So <sighs> besides like besides just the owner having to pay people to do stuff, right? Like having to pay yeah. people to do this <laughs> ride. Um, it also, of course, like if you got through the ride, you had to get. You had to get uh, stuck or people would get stuck. Right. You get to the loop or you'd get out into the loop and you'd get stuck. Yes. Oh and God. so the people who got stuck, like they eventually and then the rumors of people getting stuck too. it's not a rumor. They had to put a, a, a thing on the top for people to get out from. Um, they had to put a, a thing there. A hatch. Oh, my God. On top of that, too. Like, imagine. So you have this, again, a pretty steep drop. And then mm -hmm. a very, very steep incline for people to go up. What happens when you put dirt and rocks and stuff in a, in a piping position like that, Marie? It falls to the bottom. It falls to the bottom. So right. before you went into the loop, you were met with on the slide, just dirt and gravel and like glass and shit. Oh, my God. This is like... <sighs> How I, I can't even so it's, it's it's completely so the cannonball loop is besides how you've described it it's completely enclosed and it's a water ride yes right? so there's they're putting water in it's completely enclosed and really there's no like again there's nothing they br they brought over a Swede for a day who clearly didn't get didn't get to talk to them about like you know maintenance. Right. Didn't get to the maintenance portion. That was day two or something. Um, oh, my God. Like. 
I think the thing that's also kind of amazing about this, besides the the banality of the evil of you know people ignoring the fact that it's it's so grossly dangerous, is just the sheer hubris of something like this, right? Like that you're going to design this thing that is clearly like it, it doesn't meet any standards, including gravity. <laughs> Like, yeah, just not like not having it checked, you know, not having it checked, not, not having, yeah. but not even really seeming to like maybe care that much about that. Like maybe it's just the idea of, 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 you know, like getting the word out that it's the most dangerous. Like even if it wasn't open, it's just sitting there is just like, like you, like you were saying about going back and finding like uh, whatever that the, the blue roller coaster was that just having it there was enough to bring people out. Well, so, yeah, what's what's interesting is so the, it would only open occasionally after that initial kind of failure. And it would every single time like they'd open it and then it would close because there were there were too many injuries. So it would like it would not it would never be open for like more than a day at a time um, or like weeks at a time, let's say, to give it to give it more kind of leeway. Um, and actually, the ride would end up with the most stringent safety measures of any in the park. People had to remove jewelry. Before riding, they had to get hosed down with water. They had to be weighted down to make sure they went all the way through the loop. Oh um, but the people who had ridden it, like people who have been on the ride, reported just crazy things, right? So they reported um, coming out with mouths full of blood, missing teeth. And again, like people that were on this HBO documentary said that if you went in feast, if you went in feet first, you would always come out head first. Oh, my God. And it's, and again, not even just like besides the loop itself being super dangerous, the the end, the pool at the end was really short and super shallow. It was like it was legitimately like a maybe a foot deep. So people were coming out of this pool and just getting again injured afterwards anyways. Oh, my God. Um, That's all I've been able to say this entire episode. Oh my this God. is like truly more horrifying than so many of the other topics. Ultimately, they're scary. Ultimately, like you said, Marie, the ride would just be a like a, like it would just be like a terrifying attraction that sat. Yes. There. You know, no one ever went right. on it. It was never never really opened. Um, ultimately, so the the final two fatalities at Action Park would come in 1984. Again, a 20 year old drowning in the tidal wave pool. And then 1987, when an 18 year old drowned in the tidal wave pool again, the park. So by the mid to late 80s, the park had gotten such a reputation. And there were so many. There were so, so many lawsuits against it Mm -hmm. that it became known in the area as Traction Park or or Class Action Park. Class Action Park. That's excellent. It was so the some of the investigations were things like um, misconduct in the leasing of the land to Action Park, mm-hmm. right? So the, the owner um, Eugene Mulvihill, who was the CEO of uh, Great American Recreation, um, recreation. You know, re- sorry, recreation. Recreation was, might be good too because they're going to have to recreate a lot of a lot of physical parts of people. <laughs> so. Besides, uh, so besides like the company itself and all the related companies who uh, ultimately would run the park being investigated for like safety issues and and crimes and stuff like that, they actually were indicted. uh, It was a 110 count grand jury indictment for (laughs) operating an unauthorized insurance company. What? And so they what? So the, the one of the companies that was made up the Action Park's ownership ran their own insurance company. And that is what the insurance payouts from the park would go through. Oh my God. Yeah. So it didn't have insurance. No. And many times it did not have it for, I mean, for many seasons, actually it would operate without insurance um, and they would just pay people out whatever they asked. Oh my God. Cause it was just the reason you have insurance is again, is it has certain requirements and certain safety. It's sort of like, a safeguard right i mean it's sort of like that's why you have insurance that's why that's why companies have insurance so there's legal there's also legal precedent with things 
And just to be like, oh, sure, we have insurance. It's called the uh, death pool insurance, you know? And it's like, you just are paying people out. That's just crime. <laughs> that's just like, it's that's just crime. crime. That's just crime. That's just crime. Well, oh so what's God. crazy is at the time, so this this wasn't even in the 80s, too. This was in the 90s that they operated without insurance, without liability insurance. Oh, my Lord. And the reason is because New Jersey did not require it. Which is, um, okay, so let's, that's, I can't even. I yeah. mean, like, just with that alone, it's just that they knew that this is going on. Again, like, you know that, like, it, it, I, the only thing I can wrap my head around is they were must have been making so much money that were that's either someone was on the take, right? Because that has to be because no, well, there's no way you can ignore so much of this. Somebody had to be on the take, and they were bringing in so much money to that area that it was worth the that it was worth the risk. I mean, again, what else is there? They. What, how else? So on some weekends, they pulled in. So over the course of a season, they would pull in a million visitors. Yeah. Oh, my God. And so like this was a this was the biggest thing that was happening in Jersey at the time. You know what I mean? Million visitors. And there's no they're not putting any money into anything. Right? No, they're not paying their employees. They're not hiring enough employees. They make their own beer. Oh, uh, they're not cleaning any of the rides. Yeah. No. Oh, not my God. The guy, the guy who owned it, right? The uh -huh. guy, Mulva Hill, who was uh -huh. the person who ran the park, right? Um, was notorious for having different kind of scams and schemes. You know, he was a he was a penny stock trader um, initially. Uh -huh. Who got into who got into yeah. a tremendous amount of trouble. Right. So his company uh -huh. was uh, suspended by the SEC and then in the 70s. <laughs> Um, Action Park initially, his idea was to have a uh, a water park just to make money, right? That was his that was his general idea, and his idea really was, listen, like he he does not care about he did not care about the law, he did not care about any of this stuff. He cared about making I don't money. Say yes, mm -hmm. you know, and so yeah. all of his like <laughs> all of his stuff was. He would he would they'd get into trouble like someone would get hurt. They would offer to pay them. They would borrow money to pay them and then they would never pay back the people who they borrowed it from. Huh. And so basically like, like an, you, an excellent business model. Yeah. And so essentially what would happen was, loop of business models. <laughs> and so the idea the idea a lot of people think that um, a lot of people do think that he must have had ties to like the local mafia or something especially because of the crimes that he was part of um, included mm -hmm. like besides like tax fraud, but also like that whole uh, land deal fraud, you know, mm -hmm. which would, which at the time in Jersey would not have happened without the mafia being somehow involved or grift or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean so like waste control, anything coming in and out of that place probably yeah. too. So eventually the, there's just the sheer number of lawsuits that they owed payout on um, would cause the, the, company great american recreation to go into bankruptcy in 96 and the park closed in 1997 so that's the other part of the story that's insanity is the the park had killed a handful of people mm -hmm. by 1987 had injured hundreds hundreds of hundreds mm -hmm. and it closed 10 years later <sighs> american success insane american it exceptionalism right so there even even crazier marie mm. the park would be reopened oh sweet so in the 2000s there was a effort to reopen action park um it was purchased and then reopened and changed and the names were handled and everything else and whatever eventually it would be bought in 2014 and repurposed as the mountain creek water park which is actually still in operation today. The people from Mountain Creek are very careful to say under new management. <laughs> and, and that they have fixed all the safety problems and everything else and whatever. And it seems to be running like a normal water park. Boring. Um, so on peak operation day in its heyday in the 80s, 
The park would send up to 10 victims to local hospitals. Um, it would be known, it, it really legendary in the New York City, New Jersey area, um, Philadelphia area. And I think really the best article on it anywhere is from uh, Chris Gettard from uh, Weird New Jersey. And so he says, quote, Action Park was a true rite of passage for any New Jerseyan of my generation. When I get to talking about it with other Jerseyans, we share stories of if we are veterans who served in combat together. I suspect that many of us may have come closest to death on some of those rides up in Vernon Valley. I consider it a true shame that future generations will never know the terror of proving their grit at New Jersey's most dangerous amusement park. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? A story, Marie. <laughs> oh, New Jersey never failed to disappoint. That's what? excellent. It's it's honestly it is such a. It is such a scary. It is true. such a scary story. A scary, true story. Because like, everyone again, knew it was dangerous and nobody cared. <laughs> no one cared. No one cared. Oh, my God. I have to go try and recreate the cannonball loop or the the death pool. I was gonna say, I'm gonna is. go. I'm gonna go strap some helmets on my cats. <laughs> All right. Thank you, listeners, for listening to this episode. We'll be back next week with another hometown horror. Thank you again, dear listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist podcast. I have been your host, Chris Cogswell, joined by my co-host Marie Mayhew. If you'd like to contact the show please send us an email at the mad scientist podcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. You can also follow us on Twitter at mad scientist pod or at team giant squid for Marie. And of course you can see us on Facebook on Instagram and all over the internet as the mad scientist podcast. And again, our logo is the one with the pumpkin head. So it's easy to see. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed the show tonight, please consider supporting us on Patreon where the money that you give to us will help us to promote this show further to make it better and just to spend more time making it. Because we love doing that. We do love doing that. Our logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen. Our web design is done by Desdemona Howard. Woo-hoo. And our sound...